My name's Ira. I'm from West Lebanon Feed and Supply. I want to say welcome to everybody for coming to one of our virtual backyard living educational series on poultry raising 101, so to speak. I uh, want to uh, give everybody a, a nice welcome and, and also to say thank you to Mackenzie. She's here from Blue Seal and Kent Nutrition. Um, she's our, um, our rep at our store and she knows a lot about uh, all the different types of feeds and animal nutrition and all of that good stuff. So we're really excited to have her here. Uh, I, I just wanted to talk uh, for a second kind of about the format that seems to be working best for these virtual um, online seminars. And that is um, because of the nature of sharing the screens and that sort of thing, it's a little easier to sort of get through the content and then to do a little bit of Q&A at the end. But if you do have a question, you can also type it into the chat. I'll try to monitor that and Mackenzie will as well as we're going. Um, and we can sort of try to address it on the fly if it makes sense to do that. Or we can also take the questions at the end if that seems to work best for everybody. So again, welcome. I wanna highlight a couple quick things just that um, we have going on at West Lebanon Feed and Supply before I hand it over to Mackenzie. That is that um, for anybody that is planning to order baby chicks or other birds this year, we still are taking orders for the May deliveries. So you still have time to do that. The cutoff for baby chicks in May is actually this Sunday. So if uh, learning about it tonight was the, you know, a big part of your decision making process and you're interested, go ahead and give us a call or you can go to the website. You can put your orders in there. You can see all the birds that we have available on the pricing, et cetera, uh, for baby chicks, started pullets, turkeys, ducks, guinea fowl. Um, so whatever you're interested in trying to do. Um, and then the other thing just to highlight is uh, that we do have a sale coming up that will feature a lot of poultry products as well. That's starting, I believe, April 8th or 9th, whatever the Wednesday is um, after Easter. Excuse me. No, it's the following week. I think it's the 16th um, and it'll go through the 25th. So um, just stay tuned for that as well. It kind of coincides with that. And it's all of the springtime stuff. So you'll, um, you'll, you'll find a lot of good deals on the poultry supplies that you'll need, that sort of thing. So um, again, welcome everybody. And without further ado, I'll hand things over to Mackenzie. Awesome, thank you, Ira, appreciate it. Um, as Ira said, my name is Mackenzie and I am a territory sales representative for the Kent Nutrition Group. We make the Blue Seal and Kent Feeds products. And I have been with the Blue Seal company for 21 years. So a little bit crazy, but uh, a long time here. And I am a native from New Hampshire, even though I currently live out in New York. So without further ado, we'll get into the guts of the presentation here. In this presentation, we're going to talk about why you should get chickens, what kind of chickens you should get, how to care for those baby chicks, what kind of housing and nesting you should have prepared for them as they grow. We'll talk a little bit about predators, about laying hens, about molting, feed and water, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to play the cool video, but I'm going to give you a link on how to get to it. Um, I had a little bit of difficulties with uh, trying to get it to play earlier, so I apologize for that. So we'll get some terminology out of the way. While all of the fowl of the species Gallus gallus are called chickens, there are some more specific names for types and ages. Chicks are your baby chickens. There's also a cock or cockerel or rooster. That would be a male chicken, depending on his age. A pullet or a hen is a female chicken. A chicken is a cockerel or a pullet if less than one year of age. And then after that one year, they're referred to as a hen or a cock or rooster. A capon, we don't see too much anymore, but that is a castrated male chicken. And they used to be once revered and valued for their meat as the lack of testosterone and slower rate of gain of weight made them have better flavor. If you're doing broilers, there's also broiler or roaster chickens, depending on how long you are raising them. A broiler is about eight weeks into the freezer and a roaster is anywhere from 10 to 14 weeks into the freezer. And then layers, which are my favorite, are reared for eggs. So why should you keep chickens? First off, great tasting, nutritious eggs and meat. 
Chickens also have a lot of personality. And if you have raised chickens before, you know that. And if you haven't raised them before, you're in for a treat. Chickens can help us with social distancing, right? We don't have to go to the grocery store for eggs as often. If you let them free range, chickens are not only good to help fertilize the lawn, but they're also good at eating ticks and other unwanted bugs from the lawn. Chickens will also eat unwanted leftovers. They help with a balanced compost pile if you're putting their manure and some of the shavings into your compost. They'll also eat pretty much anything like weed clippings, grass clippings, and the sort. Some chicken questions. So do you need a rooster? Sure, you can have a rooster if you want to drive your neighbors crazy. They do tend to crow not just in the morning, but pretty much at all hours of the day. Roosters are also really good for hen protection. He will stomp around the flock and make sure that there are no predators around. If there's any other sort of intruder, he will alert the flock and get them to safety. However, you must also consider the attack rooster. This little boy seems to have a pretty big smile on his face, so I think he might have instigated this rooster, but this is also how they tend to attack. They will wait for you to turn your back to them before they come after you. Those talons can hurt. How long do chickens live? Well, if they're protected from predators and deep fryers, a chicken could live upwards of eight to 15 plus years. What breed of chicken should you get? That really depends on your purpose, what your interest levels are. Are you gonna have laying hens, vacuuming hens? Are you going to do broilers or roasters? Do you want ducks or turkeys? There's lots of different breeds out there that you can get. The American Poultry Association, the APA, lists over 400 different breeds of chickens, and most of those have several varieties within them. There are thousands of chicken shows that are held post-COVID, pre-COVID, showcasing all of these birds. And there's many different standards of perfection if you want to get into showing the birds, because that's a thing. So here's a few examples of different types and variations. We've got different types of feather coloring, a solid coloring, a barred, a pencil, or a mottled. There's different feather types. There's silkies, there's frizzles and long tails. There's different types of leg and feet variations from the silky to the salmon favorel or more. There's also different sizes. We traditionally see the standard size, but there are bantams, which are essentially mini chickens, and there are giants out there as well. Potentially, there's also some long crowers or extra loud crowers out there. A breed is a type of chicken, like a leghorn or a Plymouth Rock. A variety is the variation within the breed. So within leghorn, there's a single comb or a rose comb. There's also a white or brown leghorn. Then there's Plymouth Rock, so we could have a white rock or a barred rock within that breed. Different types of feather distribution. Who knew? There's Polish, there's Cochins, naked neck, which is this guy, the white one over here. I had a, a naked neck once. She was neurotic. I'm not really sure why. She would just run up and down the fence line pretty much all day long. There's also different comb types out there. Single, rose, P, V shape. Up in New Hampshire, it gets kind of cold. A really big comb might not be the thing that we would want to have up there just because they could be prone to frostbite. There's crossbred as well. These are pretty cool for hatcheries and for knowing what you're gonna get because the sex link can actually be sexed at hatching by their color. They're often a little bit hardier and more productive than their parent respective breeds. However, if you wanted your chickens to have babies, a sex link would not be the one because they will not breed true. So a bantam chicken, we talked a little bit about them. They tend to be, um, well, this guy's kind of full of himself right here. Um, a, a bantam is basically just a, a smaller version of a larger standard size breed. 
Um, their roosters, I will say, I have found to be some of the more aggressive roosters out there. So if you want a rooster and you don't want an aggressive one, don't go for a bantam. They're cute though. The most common commercial layer out there is the white leghorn. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later on. For leghorn, and leghorns are great for backyard operations also. I had a flock of leghorns. Um, I had a lot of eggs, I'm not gonna lie. That was a very high production year. There are other breeds that are available, um, Rhode Island Reds, Barred Plymouth Rocks, Sex Links, all a little bit heavier breeds and definitely good for your backyard operations. My favorite's the New Hampshire Red, I think. There's also different meat birds if you are interested in those. The meat bird is generally selected for fast growth. Uh, the Cornish Rock has gone from 20% uh, breast meat in the early 80s on upwards of 70% you know, breast meat these days. So uh, we've definitely bred them a little bit differently to, to grow what it is that we are interested in as, the, as a broiler or a roaster. Uh, they can grow to that slaughter size fairly rapidly, seven to 14 weeks. So as far as a commitment on, on growing and raising meat birds, it's a very short time period. Um, these breeds, because they grow so quickly, they can develop some disorders in their legs just because they get so heavy so fast. So I usually recommend to start them on a lower protein diet before transitioning them onto a higher protein broiler diet. The Cornish Rock is the most popular and likely most of what you're gonna see in the grocery store as far as meat goes. There's also some breeds like Freedom Rangers, which are a little bit slower to grow, but they're really good for uh, a pasture range um, or a free range pasture type, type of, a, of a broiler. There's also dual purpose breeds. So what I mean by that is you can rear them for either laying or for meat. Uh, these birds will take a little bit longer to get to their slaughter weight, but I am also told, somebody will have to tell me from experience, that they taste better because they tend to forage a little bit more and because they grow slower, um, some say that they have a better flavored meat. Somebody will have to let me know on that. Here's my favorite. The New Hampshire Red is an excellent dual purpose. She's very cold tolerant. She's an excellent egg producer. She's a heavier breed. So like that dual purpose that we were just talking about, she can have a good meat as well as being good on the egg production side. She tends to be broody. So what I mean by that is that she, she wants to keep her clutch of eggs and she wants to raise babies. So she would be a good mom if you decided that you wanted to um, have that rooster around for those eggs to be fertilized. The New Hampshire Reds tend to be a little bit early maturing, meaning that they are going to start laying between 20 and 22 weeks of age, uh, whereas some other breeds tend to be a little bit uh, later. So starting chicks. What do I need to take care of my chicks when they arrive? So there's a bunch of stuff that you're going to need, and this is a, a little listing here. You're going to need a brooder, a bulb, and a lamp, bedding, I recommend shavings, a feeder, something for them to eat their food out of, some food, the chick starter, a waterer, and a thermometer. All of your supplies are gonna be available at West Lab in stock today. If you're not getting your chicks the next couple of weeks, I did hear that rumor about a sale happening in a couple of weeks, so you could wait for that. So where do you get them? You can order them right from your local dealership. We should ask, um, maybe Ira can answer at the end if, um, if these birds have been vaccinated. If they have been vaccinated, they will not need to eat a medicated feed if they have not been vaccinated, they should go on a medicated feed, so you don't have to, it's just a recommendation. There's a couple of different diseases that young chicks can get. There's Merix and coccidiosis. Merix disease is highly contagious, um, and that would be the vaccination that some birds might get. Um, if, and then we just went over that um, if you got them vaccinated for coccidiosis, we're not gonna feed them that medicated feed.
So if, if you guys don't see, which you probably won't if you're getting your birds from West Leb, this is the box that the chicks arrive in. And there could be upwards of 100 birds in this box, 25 in each quadrant. Uh, as soon as they arrive, the kind of folks at West Leb will take them out of the box and show them how to eat and drink right off the bat. Um, these chicks will be one or two days of age and as soon as they are hatched out, they get sexed and put into a box. They don't have any food or water. Their bodies have enough nutrition within them in order to survive the shipping to get to West Leb. But as soon as they arrive, they need to be shown how to drink and eat. So the, the guys and girls at West Lab will actually pick the chicks up with a little head coming up between the fingers and take and dip their head into water and then pull them backwards. And what do you think that does? The little bird has gotten a little bit of water into the beak and birds do not have a sucking reflex. So they have to do it by gravity. So by knocking the head back like this, the water actually flows down the throat. And it's almost like you can see the light bulb go off in their little on their little heads. You put them back on the ground and like, I know what to do. So they go right back to the water and drink all the water that they need. Um, most birds are pretty good at going right after the feed, but if there was ever a concern, one of the members at uh, West Lab could take their finger and just tap the food, just like a mama bird would do, and the little birds would start eating. So um, I'm not going to say that I would recommend having your cat like this with birds, but I mean, if it was a really good cat, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, I just saw a meme earlier of a, um, a hen that had three kittens underneath her. So I guess that could happen, right? <laughs> Um, so create a space to hold the chicks for seven to 10 days. Your objectives are to keep them warm and comfortable. You also want to keep them close to their feed and water. Um, I'm going to pause for just a second. My dog has a dog toy. I'm sure you can hear it. Let me try and get rid of her. One moment. So sorry about that. So we're gonna create a area to hold the chicks for about seven to 10 days. Your objectives are gonna keep them warm and comfortable. You wanna keep them close to their feet and their water. And this is gonna help them to adjust to their new environment. If the ambient temperature is not greater than 65 degrees, all day long and all night, they will need to be kept indoors where the ambient temperature is at least above 65 degrees. And then we're gonna use that heat lamp to keep them even warmer. Talk about temperature again in just a second. You should allow at least one square foot per chick to start, and then we're going to grow from there. At first, you could use a cardboard box, a stop tank, or a brooder guard to keep them in. I will warn you, this won't keep them contained for very long. Why? They're going to start getting some pin feathers underneath their wings, and they're going to start flapping. And at about four days, they can jump about 18 inches to two feet of height. Uh, so you'll need to keep a lid over the top of them or get something even higher. One 250 watt infrared heat lamp for every 25 to 100 chicks. So for most of us, one bulb is going to be sufficient. I like to recommend that you have a second bulb on hand just in case. I dropped a glass and broke it last night. It could happen with the bulb also. It could burn out, um, not usually likely with a brand new one, but just have a backup um, just in case because keeping these guys very warm to start is going to be your main objective. It's recommended to keep them between 90 and 95 degrees at bird level for the first week. That's where that thermometer is gonna come in pretty handy because you're gonna wanna have that thermometer to be able to put next to the birds to be able to read how warm it is down there. And the birds are gonna tell you if they're too warm Warm or if they're too cold. If they're all clustered in underneath the lamp, they're too cold. So you need to make it warmer in there. If they're all spread out and their little wings are out, um, they're too hot. We need to raise the lamp up. Start by hanging the lamps between 18 and 20 inches above the floor and then adjust up or down as necessary. Usually just a couple of inches can change that heat at the bird level by about five degrees. 
I prefer to recommend the red infrared uh, 250 watt bulb. That allows them to sleep at night without being interrupted by the, the, the regular white light. Heat is critically important and you're gonna leave that light on for the first week of their, of their life with you. So again, temperature is pretty critical. We're gonna start them between 90 and 95 degrees. And each week we're gonna knock them back about five degrees until we get to that 65 degree ambient weather. And by that point, they should be pretty near fully feathered out and you're gonna want them out of your basement and into their coop. Um, they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be a little stinky at that time. I'm not gonna lie, they, um, they're gonna poop a little bit more, they're a little bit bigger and you're gonna be ready for them to go outside and they'll be ready also. So here's a couple of brooder ideas. Again, that kiddie pool is gonna last about three days before they start hopping out and then you've got them all over the basement or kitchen or wherever it is that you're keeping them. I'm not sure I'm entirely impressed by the, by the cardboard. I might be a little bit nervous of if that, if that bulb were to fall, could it start the cardboard on fire? It might be better to find something a little bit uh, more sturdy there. Although they've used a lot of duct tape, so that's always a good thing. We're gonna use natural light during the day if we don't need the bulb because you have it so warm where they are. And we're gonna provide them between 18 and 20 hours of light for uh, that first seven to 10 days that you've got them. And then we'll gradually reduce the light until it's just a regular day of 10 hours of light. Uh, so we can see in this brooder here that they're not clustered nor are they spread apart. So the temperature in here is just perfect for them. It's a small container. We don't allow, allow them to get too, too far. We've got food and water close to them. So in addition to monitoring the air temperature, it's also important to be cognizant of air drafts. So we want the birds to have fresh air, but we don't want to drafty air. So fresh air is gonna come from above and drafts are gonna come from below. So if you have a breezeway uh, or a mud room, that's probably not the best location to keep chicks because if that outside door keeps on opening and we have a night like last night where it drops down into the teens, that might be a little bit too cold for them to be able to maintain the proper temperature right around them. So. Finding a place to start the birds that might be a little bit less traffic and uh, not have so many drafts would be ideal. It's important to keep the birds dry, so to keep that litter clean as best as possible. If the birds somehow knock over the waterer, uh, make sure to clean up the litter and get them fresh water. We'll talk a little bit more about chick management. To start, we're gonna want a one gallon waterer for each 25 birds. And we'll want at least one inch of feeder space per chick to start. As they grow, they'll need more space. To start, we're gonna place clean feeders with clean, fresh water out for the birds. And for the chicks and for the life of the birds, keep the feeder and the waterer at the height of the back of the birds. So to start, you'll have them right on the ground, the same level as the birds. As the birds get a little bit older, use a brick or a book, encyclopedias, I don't know what else we use them for these days, and start raising that feeder up a little bit to stay even with the height of the back of the birds. What that will do is that will help to reduce contamination inside of the feeder and the waterer, what is it that chickens like to do? They like to scratch a lot, right? Scratch things behind them. So as they do that, they're throwing shavings and litter back into their feeders and their waterers. If you keep those feeders and waterers lifted up a little bit, even with the height of the back of the birds, you will help to reduce that contamination because litter doesn't tend to fly quite that high. Hope that makes sense. Some more management chip, uh, tips <laughs> as the chicks grow, um, just provide them with a little bit more space. Adults, you're gonna want between three and four square feet per bird that's inside space, not taking into consideration if they have outdoor space as well. We'll talk about that more with housing. 
Again, as they are growing, we can reduce the temperature gradually by approximately five degrees per week until we're at an ambient temperature of 65 degrees. Once they are completely feathered out and the ambient temperature outside is going to stay above 65 at night, you're safe to put them outside. Keep the litter clean and dry, changing it, adding new bedding as necessary. And important to clean those waterers at least once a week. Uh, when I was in 4-H, I showed cattle. My 4-H instructor used to say to me, Mackenzie, if you wouldn't drink out of that bucket with your cows, why would you give it to them? So kind of think the same way as your chickens. I'm not telling you to drink out of the chicken waterer, but uh, definitely make sure that, that water is going to be nice and clean and fresh for them. We want them to have good access to clean drinking water at all times. And as, uh, as birds are started and as they grow, they, you just give them feed all the time. You don't have to restrict feed them at all because chickens, as most birds do, will eat to their energy needs. So they will get themselves full and stop eating and that continues all day long. So having food available to them 24 seven is the right way to do it. So keeping your birds healthy, um, if there's ever shows again, um, isolate your birds for a couple of weeks before or after coming back from a show. Um, if you have neighbors that have chickens, it would not be ideal to have uh, your neighbors handling your birds because different flocks could have different diseases. They could pass back and forth to one another. Six signs of animals, um, chickens being a, um, a species that is often preyed upon. They don't tend to show a lot of signs until it's nearly too late. But if you, as you get to know your birds, you'll know if somebody's just a little bit off and just keep an eye on them. Um, if there is ever uh, an opportunity to keep your birds protected from wild birds, that's easier said than done because we can't control those little wild birds. Sometimes, not often, wild birds can bring in diseases from afar. So housing and nesting, again, three to five square feet per adult chicken. I'm not sure that you need this here, coop de la ville. I mean, that's a, that is a nice coop. I would definitely be thrilled to have that for my chickens, but I don't know that you need to go this crazy. It would be important to think about what type of predators that are out there in, in your area. I'm sure coons, fox, and possum are all pretty common for you as they all are for me. When protecting the birds from predators, we need to think about having a solidly built coop. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. If you wanna keep them alive, the best way to do it is to close them in at night in that solid coop, a rooster, Although he can be annoying at times, he's definitely going to keep the flock on alert in case there is a predator or some other intruder that comes through the yard. Dogs can go either way. My dog, mm, probably not gonna be helpful for you. Another dog might be as far as keeping predators away. My dog, I think, would just go after a chicken. Sometimes, not all times, sometimes electric fences can keep chickens in. Um, Sometimes when there's a will, there's a way that they'll, they'll hop out of electric fence, no worries. So let's talk a little bit about who might have nabbed your chicken. So if you come out to your coop one day and you've got several birds that have been killed, they've been mauled, but they haven't been eaten, that could be a dog. If you come out to the coop and you've got several birds that have been killed, there's lots of small bites on the body, and then the bodies are neatly piled, sometimes, not all times, and some of the heads have been eaten, that could be a mink or a weasel. If you've got several birds that have been killed and their heads or crops, the crop is the neck right here, has been eaten, that could be a raccoon. If you've got one or two birds that have been killed, mauled, or an abdomen eaten, that could be a possum. Um, I will also say that I had possum come in one night and they, they took 19 birds in one night. Um, so, and just very disappointing that they don't eat the whole thing. Like, I'm, I'm fine if you need, if you're that hungry, go for it. But if you have one bird that's been killed and the head has been eaten, could be a hawk. If you've got several birds that have disappeared and there's no trace, it wasn't me. 
If you've got birds that are missing limbs and there's birds still inside of the fence, raccoons can be pretty crafty. They, they'll actually wait outside of a fence and pretty much lure the bird to them and then try and pull them through the fence. If there's one or more birds that are dead or missing, you can't find them at all. Just a pile of feathers here or there. Could be a fox. If there's uh, chicks that have been killed and the abdomens have been eating and you've got that lingering smell, could be a skunk. And there's several others that could also go in. Um, I've seen owls take birds. Uh, snakes will take eggs. Um, there could be some other issues out there. Uh, fish or cats can uh, be opportunists. Bears are opportunists, but they would more be interested in the chicken feed than they would with the actual chickens. So I don't know if you guys might have some other predators that um, might be taken into consideration for your area. And think about that when you're building your coops. Um, if you know that you have a lot of fox or coyotes, you might wanna make sure that you dig down into the ground with your, with your outdoor coops in case they start digging, uh, they can't get too far. If you've got a lot of hawks, making sure that you have a roof over the birds will help to keep them safe from a bird flying into to take a, to take a hen. Off of the predators for a moment. Don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, sorry about that. Um, roosts, uh, you can use pretty much anything uh, for roosts except for dowels. A dowel would be too smooth. If you look at a chicken's foot, um, it's more reptilian. I don't know if you read in the beginning that uh, chickens are actually the closest living relative to dinosaurs. So they are a little more reptilian-like. Uh, so their, their feet have scales to them and they need a little bit of something rough to grip onto. So a dowel would not work because it's just too smooth. You can use a tree branch, you can use um, a regular pole. This has flat, like a, almost like a two by four, which I also like uh, because in the winter months, this will actually help to keep their feet a little bit warmer. Um, as chickens settle down to roost, they uh, settle their feathers right over their feet. So a flat surface will help to cover all of their foot, including the bottom. If you are free ranging, most birds will um, find the most expensive vehicle to roost over if there's a tree over it and then poop all over it. That definitely happens. There are portable coops. So if you want a free range, but you don't want the whole worries of predators, you can get a, 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 a coop that can actually move. So these are some examples on wheels. Um, a lot of folks that do broilers will do this also to be able to have the broilers outside and still sort of free range and forage. Uh, so you can move this coop around with the birds right in it. And that allows them to eat different things, um, fertilize the ground, but then you can move it on to a new area in a couple of days so they don't um, completely damage one area or another. This will allow them to eat different bugs and forage uh, while not having a set coop. If you are doing free range without the coop, and that's fine too, um, just be cognizant of any predators that might be in the area. I would recommend that if you're gonna have free range birds that you still have a coop for them to go to at night, um, that will help to keep them a little bit longer, especially from those predators. And if you don't let them out until after 11 o'clock or 12, it's gonna be more likely that you'll be able to find your eggs. Most hens, not all, most hens are going to lay their eggs in the morning hours. So as soon as you get up, you might hear that chicken laying an egg noise, um, which sounds a little bit like a rooster crowing. It's kind of a, um, I consider it a celebration. Like, hey, I just laid an egg, I did this, like come see it. Uh, they, they're generally gonna lay those eggs before uh, 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, so if you keep them closed up, you're gonna be more likely to find those eggs. If you allow them to free range, they could lay them just about anywhere. It might be in the same place each day, it might not. It could be behind the rhubarb, it could be up in the hayloft. Um, so keeping them contained is gonna give you a little bit more opportunity to get those eggs. 
if you are doing free range and you're concerned that the birds aren't eating enough with a vitamin mineral package, we have a product called Better Feather, which is a little bit higher protein. So that means a little bit higher concentration of vitamin mineral package and we'll provide the birds with everything they need in a smaller package as far as what they need to eat. Nest boxes. So how many nest boxes do you need? Generally, you should provide at least one nest box per every four to six hens. Here's a couple of different examples. You can make your own out of wood. You actually don't need this roost in the front. They can hop right in. Um, this might allow for other birds to be a little bit too nosy uh, with a girl who is in the box trying to lay an egg. And sometimes girls need their privacy when they're laying eggs. They might not like somebody else peeking in on them. Uh, there's also some commercially available metal boxes, also just fine. Um, the same as cleaning the litter out of the coops and the chicks, uh, keeping the nest boxes clean because periodically someone's going to poop in there and then that's just going to make your eggs dirtier. So the cleaner that you keep the nest box, the cleaner that your eggs are going to be on the other side. A nesting box should make that hen feel secure. Um, it can be pretty much any material. Here's somebody who's using a basket. That works. Um, here's another nest box that doesn't have a roost in front of it. For most standard size hens, your nest boxes should be about 14 inch square. Um, 12 inch high is gonna be more, more than sufficient for those birds. And despite offering more of a nest box for every four to six hens, they might lay them someplace else. So this was actually a coop that I had. Um, this, was a, this was a new batch of birds. So if you can see, this is their little ramp up here where that red circle is. Um, and someone laid an egg right at the top of it. This was a new set of birds. They were just starting to lay. So I think this was a mistake. Uh, I think she didn't know what was happening with her body. And then all of a sudden, like, whoa, what just happened? There's an egg right there. So uh, that can happen. Um, no worries. They will eventually find those nest boxes if you provide them. And sometimes you'll actually go out to the coop and you'll find two or three hens in one box. you will be like, really, girls? Like, come on, there's four boxes here. Nope, they're probably all going to use one anyways. If you also know in here to step back to predators, this chicken wire, I had actually dug down in about six inches and I have chicken wire over the top. Caution with using a, a, a small chicken wire on the top. If you snow load, this was brutal. Like this was a learning, learning curve for me. I probably should have gone with something a little bit bigger on the top. One inch was way too small. Every time it snowed, especially that sticky snow, I had to get out there with a shovel and get it all off. Um, so just be cognizant of that as well. I. I probably could have done better with supports underneath this in order to prevent that snow load or some sort of a shed. Um, you can also see on this side over here um, on the red box side, those are hops that are growing up the side of the chicken coop. Um, I was in a high sun area right there and I wanted to be able to provide them with some shading. So the hops are very fast growing, kind of took over and did a pretty good job of, of um, providing that shade. Um, no hops were able to grow in at bird level or about three feet up because the darn hens would keep on pecking at it and eating it too. So, but that was okay. <laughs> so the egg, this is kind of a cool fact. So we talked a little bit earlier about how the most common commercial egg layer is the white leghorn. So the earlobe of the chicken is most often going to be indicative of the color of the egg that she is going to lay. So a white leghorn has white earlobes. This hen right here has a white earlobe. She's gonna lay a white egg. There's also the olive eggers. There's the Easter eggers. They're gonna lay either a blue green egg or a green egg, and they're gonna have green or blue earlobes. How cool is that? So I know that all of you who have chickens, you're going to go out and check your earlobes on your chickens later. Um, there's always exceptions to rules, uh, but as a general rule, the earlobe color equals the egg color. So kind of something cool there. So at what age do chickens start laying eggs? 
typically about five to six months of age. It's about 20 to 22 weeks. And they're going to lay about 200 to 300 eggs per year. Chickens peak in production at about two years of age and then slowly decline after that. At three years of age, it does not mean that she's going to stop laying. I had an eight or nine year old hen that was still laying. I didn't get one, but every four days, but I still got one. So they will continue laying, but they will slow down. And there's no way physically that you can challenge her to make more eggs. So talking a little bit about shell formation, and here's where, uh, if you guys just YouTube search for virtual chicken, it's by Auburn University. It is an amazing video and I wish that I could play it for you. It's about nine or 10 minutes long and it is so worth it. Um, it, it shows the, the exact shell formation, like what happens inside of the bird as that egg is being created. So what happens is this takes between 24 and 26 hours. That's why we get an egg about one per day from each bird. Um, a, um, an ovum is released from the body of the bird and it goes through this process where the embryum, which is the, the white, gets put around it. It gets um, created uh, into this little prune shape and then water enters into the membranes by osmosis and kind of plumps up the prune. And then we take and put the calcium all the way on the outside and inside of the the oviduct where that egg is being, that shell is being placed on, the, the egg actually spins like a bullet inside of a rifle barrel. It's a really cool process and I would highly recommend just checking out that virtual chicken by Auburn University. They did a great job with it and it's really educational. The first egg. So these are a couple of examples from eggs from my chickens. So you might get one that doesn't look quite right at first. It might look like a golf ball, or maybe it looks uh, like a torpedo. Um, that's, there's a golf ball oh, back, back up there. So there's a golf ball from one of my white leg horns. Um, and there's nothing wrong with these eggs. It's just the body of the chicken getting used to what its job is. So it's not quite perfect at first. Um, so you'll go through a couple of these eggs. They're safe to eat, go for it. If you don't want to, that's fine also. Um, but it will take a couple of eggs to get back to this uh, normal looking egg. And every once in a while, you might get one of these little golf ball looking ones. You crack it open and there's no yolk in there. Weird, what happened? Just a mistake. Uh, there could have been a, a piece of um, something, dirt or debris that actually entered inside the body of the hen. And this is, all, this is an alternate way of that bird getting rid of that debris. That egg I probably wouldn't eat. Do you need a rooster in order for the hens to lay eggs? Absolutely not. Um, just like women, uh, hens are gonna be born with all of the eggs that they're going to have, all the yolks that they're going to have. Um, but if you want to have those eggs fertilized, you will need that rooster. So if you like, males can be housed uh, with anywhere from one to 10 or 12 hens. It uh, definitely de depends on the breed and age of the birds. Your ornamental birds, so your little more fancy show birds, they tend to have a few fertility problems. So I'd recommend having more roosters or fewer hens for that rooster to service. So what about that little blood spot, right? If you have ever gotten fresh eggs from, uh, from a local or if you have raised your own birds, you've probably seen that little eggs, that little blood spot near the yolk. So what does it mean? My, my mom used to tell me that it was the, the, the sign of the, the rooster left. Incorrect, mom, that's wrong. So what actually happens is it's a spot where two blood vessels have crossed over the yolk as it is emerging and it just gets broken. So then a little blood spot comes in with the yolk. Totally fine, completely normal. This happens, no big deal. Can you eat that egg? Absolutely. If you don't want to, that's fine too. But it does not indicate that this is a fertilized egg. Molting, molting happens. 
So molting you'll probably not see with your young birds if, you have, if you're getting a fresh set of birds this year, um, but you could. Molting generally happens in response to decreased light. So ambient light, I see it's gotten dark outside, although I was really excited that it was light outside at seven when we started. So as we get towards the end of summer, when we start having shorter daylight hours, a molt will happen. Again, it's not likely that it's going to happen with a new set of birds, but in year two, you will see this. And the birds look just like this girl does in the picture here. She kind of looks like she got into a bit of a tussle, right? Somebody roughed her up a little bit. This is a natural process and it's supposed to happen. It's basically the body of the bird kind of taking a break, refreshing the feathers, shedding out feathers. Your dog is probably shedding right now. If you've got a, a horse shedding right now, right? So the same kind of thing happens with birds. They shed out their feathers and grow in new ones. When they are molting, they might require a higher protein. We have a couple of different products that are available for that. A little bit more protein to help them with the regrowth of their feathers. Generally, when birds go into a molt, they're not laying. So you might have a spot of time where there are no eggs being produced. If, it's, if you want to not have that happen, you can actually provide additional light sourcing into the bird's coop to help to prevent a molt. A molt is natural, you can allow it to happen, but you will see a decreased egg production. Um, you can stop a molt from happening or decrease a molt by adding light into the coop. If you're going to add daylight into a coop, do it in the morning hours. Birds, if you notice, stop flying around at night. They stop moving at night. They've got some pretty crappy eyesight. They can't really see very well at night. So if you're gonna add daylight hours and you wanna get that 10 hour of daylight mark, you add it to the morning. If you were to add light at the end of the day, and all of a sudden here, what is it? Eight o'clock, just on eight o'clock, it's dark outside right now. If the light suddenly goes off at eight o'clock, those birds have to stop right where they are and they can't move. They will not be able to find a roost. And in the winter months, that might mean that they could get a little bit cold. So better to have like a timer set in the coop for light to come on at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., whatever the, whatever the timing is for when it gets uh, dark in the afternoon. I hope that that makes sense. We can ask questions at the end if I didn't make sense there. When they go through this tussle stage of molting, uh, they are going to grow new feathers back. So don't worry that they're losing all their feathers and they're never going to come back. They go through a stage where they look a little bit ugly, but don't worry, those beautiful feathers will grow back. There, I just um, over communicated the daylight, um, adding daylight there. Um, but here it is again to if you want to continue with. Uh, continue with eggs, you can do that light stimulation, adding that light into the beginning of the day. This girl looks um, particularly bad. These, you, it, you can't really tell too, too closely, but what's actually happening here is these are pin feathers that are starting to come back out. So this is actually the new growth of what this, what she's going to look like when the new growth of feather starts coming out. So let's talk a little bit about food and water. Uh, speaking of that molting, we talked on a little bit before about feeding those foragers. Um, we do have a new Better Feather product that's out there, and it really does help to um, support that regrowth of feathers during that molt. We also have uh, NutriVantage in there, which is a nutrition optimizer, helping to support the immune function as they're going through their molts. And it does provide the proper amount of calcium to feed the whole flock, so that if you have some who aren't going through a molt, they will still get the calcium that they need for egg production. Feeders and waterers. There are a lot available out there on the market. West Lab has uh, several different varieties that you'll be able to look at when you go check out their shelf. Um, whatever it is that you need, you, if you've got you know, 12 birds, I don't know that you need to go with a 30 gallon waterer or a 50 gallon feeder. Um, keep it uh, so that you can keep the water fresh uh, without wasting too much and the same on the food side. Uh, if we see here, this is, looks like a five gallon bucket that has some nipple waterers underneath it because chickens will, um, will be 
fine to be trained to a nipple waterer, which tends to be a little bit less waste because there's less chance of them contaminating that water with their scratching around. Different type of feeders out there is a little uh, homemade job there. Um, not so sure that would be the best choice for outside as it is here, um, unless you know rain is not in the forecast at all, but it looks to me like that's got no lid and the food could get wet. Generally, once feed gets wet, the birds aren't really too interested in it. I get it, birds. Like, I don't like cornflakes once they're super soggy either. Um, so making sure that feed stays dry is going to be important. Um, these feeders on the ground over here are great if you've got young, small birds. Uh, but as they grow, you're going to have to raise that up. I really prefer these hanging feeders. Uh, because you can easily raise them up without having bricks underneath them and a chance of the birds knocking them over at some point. Sometimes allowing them to, allowing them to, uh, sorry about that, uh, allowing them to clean the feeders out every once in a while. Um, just make sure if there has any, mo if any moisture has entered into that feeder that you knock that out. Um, we don't want to be providing any moldy feed for those birds in there. That's my dog. Again, more waterers, uh, different choices that are out there. Here's a homemade job. Um, I like the vacuum sealed ones, but again, your preference. Um, the metal waterers are nice because in the winter months, you can get a heated base as an electric heated base to put these on top of, which will help to keep that water above freezing so that you don't have to worry about the birds being able to have water all day. Fresh, clean water is crucial. There is, if there's anything, this is the most important slide. Hens that are gonna go without water for more than 24 hours, they're gonna stop laying and they may have their laying disrupted for a week or more. They might not get back into their cycle. If they go without water for 36 hours, it could actually trigger a molt, which would put them into a non-laying period of upwards of three to six months. Clearly not what we want with laying hens, right? So making sure that they have that clean, fresh water all the time is gonna be crucial. If you're gonna go away for a couple of days, Chickens are pretty easy. You can leave them and not have to worry about them, but make sure that they have plenty of water. Make sure they have plenty of food out there. Different types of feed out there. Is there one right or wrong? No, it's kind of your choice. I would look after either a meal or mash or a crumble size for your young birds. As you get into the larger size birds, you can feed anything. Um, in commercial operations, the meal or pellet is the most popular. It, it depends on the birds. I've got some customers that tell me my birds want anything but pellets and others that say, no, my birds want anything else but mash. Um, I'm a pellet believer. And the reason for that is if the pellets do get scratched out of the feeder or if you miss when you're dumping it in and there's pellets everywhere, it's easy for the birds to find that pellet. Whereas in a meal or a crumble form, it can be a little bit more challenging for them to find it. Again, it's entirely up to you and what you're comfortable with feeding or what you find that your birds prefer. Those chicks should be started on a meal or mash um, and then can graduate up to a crumble. So there again, the different forms. This little chick is going after a crumble here. I'm sorry, a mash here. A crumble looks a little bit more like grape nuts. Um, I've used that example a couple of times of them looking like grape nuts and I've told that that's very dated and I should find another example. Um, I love grape nuts, so I don't know what's wrong with that example. Um, and then a pellet um, is uh, just a, a traditional pellet uh, under one inch of length. I like grape nuts, might have them for dinner. So here's the avian digestive system. We're not gonna get too, too in depth with this, but if anybody has ever heard the phrase as rare as hen's teeth, um, that is because they don't have any teeth. So if you found a hen's tooth, that'd be pretty crazy, right? Um, so instead of having teeth, they have a crop, which is an adaptation of their esophagus and is basically this little pouch. 
And the pouch has these striations in it and these folds inside of it. And the pouch actually grinds back and forth on itself. That's what little striations and little folds inside of the crop do. To help with that grinding process, chickens eat rocks and grit. So if you have a inside set of birds and they are not allowed to go outside, you're going to need to provide them with grit, especially if you're providing them with their feed in a pelleted form. Um, if you have chickens free ranging, you're gonna see them pecking at the ground and eating rocks. You're gonna be like, well, what am I buying this food for if they're just eating rocks? What they're actually doing is taking that piece of rock into their crop and inside of the crop it is actually acting as their teeth so inside of the folds it helps to grind back and forth back and forth to help break down those pellets so kind of cool there again if your birds do not have access to going outside you are going to need to provide a grit if they are foragers and they have access to dirt you most likely do not need to provide a grit. How much feed do chickens eat? Well, it depends on the breed, their size, etc. But on generally between four and six ounces of feed per bird per day. You can teach chickens to do tricks, just so you know. Um, so how much will a, will a chicken eat? A chicken is going to eat about one and a half pounds per bird per week. Ducks and game birds will eat about the same depending on their size. Geese, three pounds per bird per week. Turkeys, they're much bigger birds, right? So they're going to eat between four and five pounds per bird per week. And that will get more as they get older and towards their slaughter date. And you can teach them to do tricks. And I want someone to make a video like this. What, what's the new thing? TikTok these days? This should be done. So different feeds that are available out there. What should you feed? It's going to depend on the purpose, the age, and sometimes the season. We've got uh, just about everything you could possibly want in your, in your poultry feeds. We have a complete line for everything from chickens, both layers and broilers, turkeys, ducks, and game birds. It's made in Vermont, so not too far away. We pride ourselves on consistency and freshness of our product. So West Leb is going to order that feed, and within a week, it's going to land fresh at their doorstep. Each of our feeds, and there's quite a few available out there, is going to be specifically designed to, to really meet those nutritional requirements. And we have a lot of research. Our research facility is out in Muscatine, Iowa, and we have done quite a bit of poultry research in order to make sure we are doing the right thing for these birds. We also utilize the NRC, which is the National Resource Council. That's a conglomeration of veterinarians and nutritionists that to get together to um, evaluate what each age and class of bird needs. Some of the features and benefits in the Blue Seal products, we utilize something called NutriVantage, which is uh, basically a probiotic for the immune system. It really helps to boost up the immune function of the birds to help keep them healthier and live longer. Uh, we've done a couple of studies, especially in heat stress, where it has actually helped the birds to uh, reduce their stress level during those heat moments um, in order to maintain laying and not have any issues from that heat. All of our feeds are gonna be balanced properly for vitamin mineral package as well as protein package. I mentioned earlier that birds eat to their energy level. So finding a, a, a poultry feed that is going to be higher energy and lower fiber means that they're actually going to eat exactly what they need and get everything that they need in order to lay properly and be able to maintain vital life, vital life functions. All of our feeds are going to be a whole grain-based diet, um, and it's going to support your optimal growth and development, as well as egg laying. 
We've got prebiotics and enzymes in all of our foods, um, different enzymes, proprietary hydrolyzed yeast. That's going to help in digestion and maintaining nutrient digestibility. So how the bird is going to be able to utilize nutrients that are in the feedstuffs. We use a marigold extract that's going to enhance that color of the yolk to be a deeper yellow. We also have a bunch of essential amino acids in there, and that's going to help with the growth and development of the bird, as well as supporting skin and feathers. I mentioned earlier that we have both medicated and non-medicated feeds for your chick starters. If not vaccinated, I do recommend using our Emprilium medicated feed. Basically what this does is it's almost like giving the birds a vaccination through feed. So it's going to allow them to get that coccidiosis and build up an immunity within their own bodies. And then you stop feeding that medication. Medicated feeds is only recommended through eight weeks of age. If you don't want to feed a medicated, totally fine. We have non-medicated and organic versions available. So we do have an organic starter, grower, and layer product. This is good for most classes, except for your turkeys. And then we've got uh, traditional feeds uh, recommended for the laying hens to start on our starter, either medicated or non-medicated, transition after the eight weeks onto our grow and show. And then at 20 weeks or first egg, we would transition onto the extra egg pellet meal or crumble, whichever your preference may be. And again, always provide a consistent supply of fresh, clean water. If you would not want to drink the water out of the waterer with your birds, don't provide it to the birds, get a clean set and provide feed free choice, but you can allow them to clean it up every once in a while if you want to clean that feeder out. And we do have a poultry care guide that's available at the info desk at West Lab with all of this information in there. I think that's it. That's um, my phone number and email address. You can call me, you can text me, you can email me. Anything but smoke signals will get to me, uh, whatever your preference may be. Um, and be sure if you guys are interested to get onto that, um, that YouTube and do the virtual chicken by Auburn University. It's just an, it's an awesome, awesome presentation. Thank you guys. Um, you've been very quiet out there. Uh, I haven't been able to see any chats come through, so I apologize for that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe then I can open up the chats. Uh, Ira, I don't know if you had anything come through. Oh gosh, okay, there's some. Yeah, there's a, there are a few things. Mackenzie, the, maybe the first one that came through was somebody was asking about brooder plates. Now, we don't sell them i mean we we kind of go with the brooder lamps and we do have some heat pads and things um not a lot of demand for those i, I know we can get them if need be but uh it's not something we sell in the store if anybody doesn't know what a brooder plate is it's sort of just like an ambient heat thing that you can set up and raise and lower and baby chicks will tend to kind of huddle underneath um and get warm that way instead of using using the bulb so Mackenzie, I don't know if you have experience with that or any feedback on that. No, I don't have experience with those. They haven't been, um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to say widely available, but um, cost effective for most of the uh, smaller backyard operations that I have worked with. Um, so I don't have any experience with those. I apologize. I will say that the other sort of practical advantage of the brooder lamp is uh, Mackenzie was talking a lot about kind of the circadian rhythm and the amount of daylight needed in order to um, keep them from molting later in life. So what a lot of people will do is obviously use the brooder lamp early on, mainly for heat, but then you can use the daylight simulating bulb in that as well in a coop to make sure, especially during the winter months, that you're supplementing with some extra light when we get those really short eight hour days. And a lot of people will have it click on for an extra two to four hours, that kind of thing, just to make sure that they're getting as much light through the winter months as they need. So um, there was a question in there about guinea fowl and kind of the, the program being similar, not identical, but similar, but somebody was asking, does all of this information pertain to guinea fowl as well? 
Yes, all of this information would pertain to guinea fowl. You would just use a different food. Um, we would not use the medicated. We're going to use a 22% protein and the multi-flock uh, to start those birds. Um, so and guinea chicks are pretty much the same size as a traditional standard uh, bird. So there, there aren't too many worries with them as far as the different waterers that you would use. Um, quail, if you've ever, um, if you've ever raised quail, they're like the size of my pinky. They're so teeny. Uh, so if you ever decide to do that type of a game bird inside of the, um, the, the water, or you would need to put in some pebbles, like, um, like you would put in a fish tank or something like that to just have a little bit of water available to the birds kind of coming up through there. Otherwise, um, they're not the brightest of birds and they might drown themselves. So Mackenzie, there was a question about the run being on concrete. Um, and should they put shavings or soil or something down? Yep, uh, you, can, you, you can absolutely raise them on concrete. Um, I would definitely recommend shavings. Um, they're probably going to scratch down to the bottom of it to try and get to, I don't know, the, the other side of the earth. <laughs> uh, they, they do like to do that, but concrete's just fine. Just keep it clean, keep it dry. Uh, that would be the most important thing is clean and dry and then having that temperature be correct for them. Um, and you keep them on concrete as chicks if you keep them to the right temperature and absolutely as adults. Um, just keeping them clean and dry. Um, and that will help not only with the health, overall health of the birds, but also the cleanliness of your eggs. Um, so I, I am not a fan of washing eggs just because I don't have that much time. So I'd much rather keep my coop clean and my nest boxes clean so that the eggs can then be clean. And also gathering them once a day will be very important to help keep those eggs clean. I think one added consideration on the concrete is just that I, I have a little experience with that too. And the only thing that we did find is, I mean, if it's just for the run, that concrete does get very, very cold. So, I mean, it's, it is something to keep an eye on just temperature in general. I mean, they, they did fine, but adding that insulation from the shavings seemed to make them a little more comfortable just in the winter. I've also um, had folks use uh, a clean uh, mulch like you would use in your garden for bedding um, and use that on the base layer. And that provides a little bit of insulation underneath the shavings. Some folks, I mean, you could use mulch as the bedding, but a little more challenging to clean and I would think a little bit more expensive. So Mackenzie, someone had a question about um, apple cider vinegar in the water or herbal teas, that sort of thing. I know there's a slew of um, homeopathic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all lines of different things for poultry that, uh, I mean, some of them we, we've gotten into a little bit because there's some demand, but uh, do you have thoughts on that? I don't have any thoughts on that. Um, I, I have heard of lots of people using them and mixed results or no results. Uh, I, there's no problem with introducing that into your bird's water. So if that's something that you want to go for, um, you can absolutely do it. The, the nice thing about the blue seal feeds is that we do include that NutriVantage, which is an immune function booster. So it will help with not only boosting up that immune function so the birds are nice and healthy, but it'll help keep their digestive system healthy as well so that they can continue digesting properly. Um, again, birds being a prey animal, they don't often show symptoms of what is or could be wrong with them until it's too late. Um, uh, I don't have any uh, experience or research backing up whether or not apple cider vinegar is a good thing or a bad thing, but um, my, my feeling, my opinion is go for it. And we'll, do, we'll do some sort of quick fire questions here for you, Mackenzie. I'm sure you're looking at them in the chat too. How do you know if an egg is for eating or if it has a chick in it? You can do candling and floating of eggs to know if there is, uh, if there is a chick inside of there. Um, there's little tutorials that you can look at online in order to, in order to do that. Um, if you don't have a rooster, pretty much guaranteed there's no chick inside of there. If you do have a rooster, um, then that would be where, where there could be that, that chance or that risk. 
if you are collecting eggs every single day and you do have a rooster, so there might be fertilization concerns. If you're collecting the eggs every day, there's no worry. There's that that egg hasn't hasn't started to create that chick inside of there as of yet. If you're waiting to just gather eggs up once a week, that could be concerning. So then I would do a candling or the water test, which is how it floats inside of that water. There's a bunch of tutorials on on YouTube that we can do for that. So we have 16 hens and one rooster. How can we know if they're getting enough to eat? Keeping you said, the you, go ahead, sorry. Feed her full at all times. Just keep it full. Birds eat their energy needs. So energy needs change day to day, right? Um, on a super cold day, they're probably going to need to eat more to be able to maintain their body temperature as opposed to a very hot day where they're not likely going to need to eat as much because they don't have as much heat needs. They don't have to create heat in their body. They just need to maintain vital life functions. So really just keeping that feeder full at all times is going to be your best bet to know if everyone's getting enough to eat. And this is a question for us. Are the chicks at West Lebanon Feed and Supply vaccinated? The answer to that is no. And that's a decision that we make because a lot of our customers choose um, to, to raise their birds organically um, and to feed an organic feed and uh, to make sure that, that nothing like that is going into them. So um, we bring them in, not Merrick's vac vaccinated, and we do recommend um, for anyone that's not necessarily interested in that, that as Mackenzie pointed out, you use the, um, the starter meal AM with the amprolium in it, um, using vitamin and electrolyte packet in the water, that sort of thing, just to help boost the immunity um, at the early stage. So, but the answer is no, we do not bring them in vaccinated um, purposefully for that reason. And then Lastly, Mackenzie, the question is, uh, my chicks are one week old. When can I introduce veggie scraps? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, the birds should be um, completely feathered out before we start introducing other snacks, I'll call it. Um, and I would recommend that if you're going to be feeding snacks like that, that you do it in the afternoon hours. Um, again, sort of like getting them to lay their egg inside, you want them to eat their regular food to get their energy needs um, built up before you give them those scraps. And I usually recommend with scraps or other things that uh, you're going to give them to eat that they clean it up within 10 or 15 minutes. Um, if if more than that is given, then it's probably too much and that could offset what their what their commercial feed is going to provide. Um, and sometimes those scraps are a little more um, enticing, uh, more candy like than than their regular foods. They might go after those new things. Um, and birds will also go after like I had uh, I had my flock out one day and all of a sudden they all start chasing after one hen. I'm like, what's going on? Well, that, that lead hen had found a frog and she had it in her mouth and didn't, <laughs> didn't want anybody else to have it. So it was, it was rather entertaining. Um, the frog didn't make it, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, that's a, a question that we get asked a lot too because a lot of people uh, grew up feeding a lot of corn and that kind of thing, you know, so they'll buy cracked corn and just feed that to the birds. And one of the things we have to talk about is look, you're at about half the protein as you yeah. are in the commercial feed in the blue seal feeds. So, uh, you know, imagine what you're doing to kind of the diet and the production and the overall nutrition that the birds are getting. You're just yeah. cutting it in half. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the birds aren't going to survive, but they're certainly not going to thrive and they're not going to provide you with the number of eggs that you're interested in. So let's say you've got a small flock of six hens and you're only feeding the, the a cracked corn, you might only get three eggs a day. Um, is that going to cut it for your needs? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's fine. Um, but the, the blue seal products are going to the whole packet in order to maintain vital life functions, have nice feathers, uh, give you some nice eggs, um, and still be there for a couple of scraps here and there. <laughs> 
Um, I see the, the next question here is a whole other presentation. <laughs> um, what, do we, what can we do for the hen who is at the bottom of the pecking order? So I didn't touch upon this because it really is such a huge topic. The pecking order is so, so real, right? And it can change. You know, the top bird, if you introduce somebody else or if something happens in the environment, the whole pecking order can get re, um, reestablished. Um, the best thing that we can do for birds is to make sure that they have ample space. Um, I like to use the example of I've got four really close girlfriends, right? I love them all to pieces. But if we were all stuck in an elevator for three days, pretty sure one of them is going to get punched in the face and I know who it's going to be. So the, the closer the confinement, the more risk there is of that pecking order being cannibalistic because that can happen or being detrimental to any one bird. So providing with more space is the, the easiest thing that you can do to prevent a, a, a problem from that bird, for, for that bird on the bottom of the pecking order. I'm not sure that that fully answers the question, Mary Ann, uh, because it really is a very broad topic that um, there's lots of things that we could do. Um, I'm not sure that everyone wants to be here until 10. I, I would say too, if you come in and talk to us about that or call us up and talk to us, we do have some other, um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is if they have been getting pecked on, you really want to address that quickly because that can sort of create, you know, a, a sort of frenzy from the entire flock. If you've got one that's losing feathers or there's, you know, an exposed wound or something like that. So I'm um, taking care of that quickly and we've got some options to help you with that. So birds do tend to go after blood spots. So if one bird or another um, with a, a new feather that's emerging, um, that little blood spot, um, that can be like, ooh, what's going on over there? I'm just going to take a little peck and check that out. And that could create a further problem. So I was absolutely correct that if you can remove that bird from the situation and get her to heal up before you reintroduce her. Um, sometimes a trick for reintroducing a bird that has been taken out of a flock um, that will work to prevent her from being tossed right back to the bottom of the pecking order again is to introduce her at night after everyone has gone to roost. Um, generally speaking, when everybody wakes up, it'll be like, oh, you were here the whole time. Okay, carry on. Um, so I mean, birds have little pea-sized brains. Um, so sometimes they're not so bright, and then sometimes it's all instinct. Um, and just when I say something, I'm sure they'll figure out another way to to go against me. So, uh, but definitely a big topic, Mary Ann. So um, West Lab folks are are pretty well equipped to help you too, if that didn't answer your question. And Mary Ann, you asked, and this will be the last sort of question that we'll we'll address because we are going a little long here and we know everybody's, I mean, it's the middle of the work week. So um, we're trying to respect everybody's time. Um, it was just the, the space and I know it was in the slides, Mackenzie, and I think I want to say it was three to five. Yeah. Okay. Three to five square feet. Now that seems to throw people off a little because that's not really that much space when you think a two by three is six square feet. So that's more than you need per bird. So a lot of people have these like 20 by 30 chicken coops that they're building. And it's, I mean, that's, that's way beyond what's required. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's lovely, but as far as the requirement, does that seem right, Mackenzie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, totally I just want, yeah, I, I want to do uh Again, say hey, a huge thank you, Mackenzie, for uh, spending time with us this evening. That was a ton of a ton of awesome information. Uh, really, really packed full of uh, really helpful things. So I'm sure everybody very much appreciates that. And to uh, Blue Seal for uh, equipping our our customers, and we're so happy to be uh, offering that your products and. Uh, and for our exciting chick days that are coming up this spring. A um, couple other quick things that I did just want to mention before we end the meeting is another new product that we did bring in this year that we've never had before is a poultry starter kit, which is 
everything you need all in one little uh, handy box. Um, another thing that I did want to mention just about the um, the chick days that we do at our store, they're a little bit different than what you may find at some of the other farm and feed places. I know a lot of times you'll go into one of the big, um, one of the big stores and they'll just kind of have chicks all the time. We, we do it a little bit differently and we think that that's a really important thing for the health and well-being of the birds. So um, we do chick days, we bring them in, they're all pre-ordered and they go out within a couple of days. We don't like them to be around too long because that's just a lot of stress over a long period of time. Um, we put them into brooders. As I mentioned before, we put them on organic feed um, so that you can continue that if you so choose. Um, we use a lot of best practices just to make sure that the, the health is there and that you're getting a, a quality uh, stock when you walk out of the store. So, and then the, the last thing that I wanted to mention is uh, Mackenzie talked a lot at the beginning about how many eggs you could potentially be getting. So if you're getting a half dozen or a dozen birds, um, a couple hundred eggs a year per bird might seem overwhelming. Well, good news. We have an awesome program. We, um, for anybody that's local to the upper Valley, uh, we work with willing hands and you may or may not be familiar with them but we do an egg donation program that we designed and launched back in 2009. And if you have surplus eggs and your neighbors are raising chickens and suddenly it's impossible to give these eggs away, well, eggs are the single most requested thing that Willing Hands is out there delivering to people. So they're bringing them to food pantries um, and to places like the Upper Valley Haven um, and, and uh, some assisted living places and uh, they're giving out the eggs that are donated from customers of ours. So it's a really awesome program called Share the Harvest. You can ask us more about it, but if you suddenly find yourself up to your neck in eggs, we're, we'll gladly make sure that they get to somebody who can use them. So that's just another helpful thing we can do. So thank you so much again. We are going to make uh, all of this information available to you after the fact. So, and if you do have any questions, feel free to call us, email us, visit our website to check out the poultry program that we're offering right now. It's westlebanonsupply.com. And uh, again, thank you to Mackenzie and Blue Seal for all that they offer. And everybody have a great night. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Ira, do you want this presentation I left? Bad ideas.